Hello, my name is Mark Morton. I'm head of tax at Mercia Group, and welcome to this uh, latest February uh, Newswire bulletin, uh, giving you a bit of information on what's been happening in the last three or four weeks. Uh, to be honest, a uh, fairly quiet time from both the revenue and uh, the tribunal system. So it's been a pretty quiet period. I assume everybody's gathering their strength for the budget and whatever that may bring. Obviously, we know budget date is the 3rd of March. And as always, we'll be providing uh, comprehensive products. So tax cards, budget booklets, etc. Also, uh, an instant uh, reaction webinar the following day. So if you have any interest in those areas, um, please feel free to uh, have a look at our website. I, I think uh, as it stands, I wouldn't want to try and second guess what the Chancellor may or may not do. Uh, I'd take a, a sneaky bet on uh, CGT rates. It's quite interesting when you look at what is going on this month in a parliamentary sense. We've had one or two um, bits of information, a bit like Chinese water torture actually, dr dripping out of the revenue. So. We've had a few figures appear on van benefits, fuel benefits for company cars, uh, personal allowance appearing, um, uh, national insurance rates and so on appearing, all drip, 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 uh, and yet we don't have CGT annual exemption. And of course, until the budget, we don't know whether the figures that are being published will be overridden or not. Um, we don't know, for example, whether there'll be an, extamp uh, an extension to the stamp duty uh, land tax holiday, if you want to call it that. So uh, bits of information floating around if you're uh, a bit of a tax geek like me, uh, but take it with a pinch of salt because, you know, it's a strange old year. We all know that. And who knows what the Chancellor may do. A distinct lack of leaks, let's say, at the moment. So we, sh we, we wait to uh, hear. A bit more definitive in things we have been told. We've had some information from the revenue um, on self-assessment filing penalties. Uh, you may have caught that in the last bulletin. Um, the reason for mentioning it again is uh, we've had, I suppose, a couple of questions that have come in about the exact terms of that. The detail is in the Newswire bulletin, so feel free to click and read the link yourself uh, and the statement from the revenue. But it was making a very distinct point that what the revenue were talking about here was late filing penalties. Um, so the filing date has essentially been um, kept at 31st of January, but what the revenue are saying is as long as you file your SA return by 28th of Feb, then there will be no 100 quid late filing penalty. Of course, once you get after Feb, then they will start to appear and normal rules then apply to subsequent penalties, dailies that we'll have seen in the past as well. So, albeit a 28 day deferral, it's not an unlimited time frame. And I think that the other thing that goes hand in glove with that that really hasn't been talked about. Uh, by the revenue is the ability to defer your payment on account stroke balancing payment. So we'd obviously had the payment on account deferral from last July, uh, potentially taken by some clients. In that respect, they didn't have to do anything. They just chose not to pay and that was the end of it. It's a bit different uh, coming through to 31st of Jan. So what the revenue have said is that in circumstances, if your liability is 30,000 or below as at 31st of January, um, i.e. that could be your payment on account for July, your balancing payment for January and your payment on account for January, if the total due at that stage is less than 30 grand, then you can go on online and apply for further deferral. A couple of points to note on that. A, uh, if your liability is more than 30,000, there is still the more general time to pay facility but B, you are carrying interest on those figures. Um, so there is a distinction going on at the moment between returns and payment, um, and the facilities are different. And of course, in order to be able to defer your payment, the revenue have got to know what it is, and consequently, you've got to send your return in first. So there's a bit of chicken and egg going on here, but those two facilities are there uh, to access for clients if they're so inclined and a little bit behind the curve currently. Uh, we talk about that, amongst other things, in our uh, personal and employment taxes course, which is uh, going on at the moment. So feel free, if you've not already, to to log on to that and um, join us to discuss all things personal and employment related. The secondary statement that we've had uh, relates to VAT deferral. Um, and you'll see this again in the newswire with a, with a link, so you can click into this as well. Obviously, we had that period sort of last March to last June-ish, whereby... 
if a business's VAT payments were becoming due in that particular window of time, they could defer it, not pay it. And the original terms of that deferral was that you've got to pay it up before the start of the new financial year, i.e. sort of 31st of March, 1st of April this year, but, but basically no other terms. Again, you just didn't pay and you sorted it out later in the financial year. The government have extended that. So if you chose that original VAT deferral, you can defer it again. Um, now, it's interesting. The self-assessment um, time frame for deferral that I mentioned a few minutes ago is basically deferral for the next tax year. So you get 12 installments and away you go. The VAT one is a bit different. You can choose to defer the VAT amount over two months, three months, five months, up to 11 months. And the other interesting thing about that is those that VAT deferral uh, and the VAT being deferred and paid in installments is not carrying interest. So again, you have a bit of, I suppose, um, lack of consistency for whatever reason between those two payment deferral processes. Uh, both the SA and the VAT one are um, formal deferral processes, but I would mention again the more general time to pay. Probably, you know, in most of our lifetimes, in most of our careers, on a more general basis, the revenue are more open to time to pay than they ever have been before. So I think the moral for clients, if they are experiencing you know, difficulties in meeting their tax bills, please ask them to get in touch with the revenue and get something agreed. You know, you don't want the revenue knocking on the door saying you owe us X and getting more formal about it. But so we've had movement on um, some of the payment facilities, uh, some of the late filing facilities. And again, uh, some more information on that covered in our spring tax update course. So again, if you if you want to log on and join us, please feel free. The last thing I was going to, um, or the penultimate thing I was going to mention, I, uh, I should mention, you will see in our Newswire bulletin, or you may be able to see, a download to do with uh, low uh, value imports, which is something which I know um, absolutely zilch about. It's VAT. Uh, I kind of know what VAT stands for, but one of my colleagues, Emma, uh, our VAT expert at Mercia, she has been doing a number of articles and products in relation to Brexit and how it affects VAT, which is, uh, you know, that and customs and excise is really where the main effects currently are. Um, again, we have a devoted web page to Brexit and VAT, so uh, feel free to read further, research further, you know, watch Emma um, talk about the, the VAT aspects that, that, that have come in. I think on the flip side, coming back to me for a moment, uh, I wouldn't want to talk about any of those. But interestingly, in terms of direct taxation, very, very little comment from the revenue at the moment. You will see a link in the newswire to a Brexit edition, which was really sort of, again, more that related, a little bit about pairs you earn an NI for employees that may be working abroad but actually direct taxation uh, very little comment from the revenue at the moment and one would imagine as times goes by we will get more information uh, on what the revenue perceived brexit may do in a in a direct tax sense final thing i was going to mention uh, you will see a link in the uh, bulletin again to it uh, there is a devoted blog in it that i've written just really looking at the off pay rolling rules um, a reminder of the requirements what has become clear in the last few days, the revenue have, have issued uh, a, what they call a briefing, laying out their compliance strategy, essentially, in relation to this. So what appears quite clear is that April 2021 is a firm date that is going to go ahead, of course, until budget day when the Chancellor says, oh, no, we'll defer it again. Frankly, I would be very surprised if it, if it is deferred. Um, it was deferred in extremis uh, a year ago. We've had a year to you know, get to grips with lockdown for businesses to, to get used to that. Uh, strangely enough, I have come across a case in the last week where a big multinational started off pay rolling on 1st of Jan, which is a bit unfortunate because there's no legal basis for that. So I suggested to the relevant and intermediary and worker, they would go back and say, you know, what are you playing at? Give me the money back. But that, that is incorrect. You know, it starts essentially 6th of April, services provided from the 6th of April and payments uh, post 6th of April that relate to those post 6th of April services. So, you know, that is just plain wrong. And interestingly, uh, I, I've just written um, an answer to one of the taxation magazine queries. There are a lot of misunderstandings about the mechanics of, I think, the calculation, particularly the position of the recipient and what they're supposed to do 
when money coming into their companies has been pay as you earned. Um, I don't think the government are going to defer it because it, this is this change is supposed to generate a billion quid a year, which of course means will only be three hundred and ninety nine billion quid in arrears. Um, but I would guess it's any money gratefully received. Uh, so the compliance strategy basically seems to be saying we will go ahead, we will support businesses, but we will punish those who don't get it right. We will not use the change uh, in April to, to go back and suddenly raise inquiries into what you were doing with IR35 in the preceding 20 years, which I do find a bit strange. I think if I was still working in the revenue, that's precisely what I would do. And so, you know, somebody else has deemed that you are actually really a, an employee in inverted commas. Why weren't you doing your own deemed payment calculation for, 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 for preceding years? Reminding clients, I think, clearly, uh, depending on, you know, should they be, as an engager, looking at this more seriously, that may open a can of worms with general status, you know, agency rules, etc. It isn't all just about off-pay rolling. What is the position of the recipient? Do they understand? And I think one of the big issues for intermediaries which are caught is, you know, how do I extract the cash? We're pretending and I'm an employee, I'm going to get a P60 that goes on my tax return. But in reality, the cash is in my company and there has to be a legal mechanism to get that out, whether that be by pay as you earn or dividends or whatever. So if you have got clients at either end of that equation, there's quite a lot to think about. Uh, we are running and we have run um, off pay rolling courses. So if you are interested, please feel free to log on. Um, they're available on our website because if you're affected, there's going to be a significant change potentially from April onwards. So there you go. That's a bit of our update for February. Uh, hopefully that all makes sense. Um, I will hopefully see you again in March and we will know a bit more further whether capital gains has gone up to 40%, you know, marginal rate, whether inheritance tax has gone up to 80% or actually whether not a lot has changed this year at all. So we'll keep you up to date as always. Nice to see you and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Hello and welcome to this month's Newswire. My name is Jeremy Williams longer hair than ever and desperately waiting for the hairdressers to open again. Uh, so here we are with a glimmer of hope that uh, there will be an end to the lockdown. Uh, we're recording this towards the end of February and this is the ANA segment. Now there's not much happened in this month uh, in terms of ANA developments. Uh, so I'm going to look at five separate topics uh, with you. Uh, and let's start with COVID-19 and guidance from the FRC and from ICAW. Now, the FRC have had guidance for auditors on COVID-19 uh, and they've updated that throughout 2020 and now into 2021. Uh, and they periodically consolidate the guidance so that you don't have to look back at previous versions. Everything is all in one place, which I think is actually quite a nice way to do this. So yet again, they've consolidated their guidance for auditors. Uh, the link is in Newswire. Uh, and the main area of change, I think, is that they've added a bit more on fraud. Um, we are seeing a new focus on fraud, in particular, in related to the benefits that companies have received um, in, in terms of government assistance, loans, um, insurance claims and other issues like that. Uh, and while we hope the vast majority of those have been genuine and properly claimed, um, auditors need to be alert to the possibility that there were fraudulent claims or claims made uh, when the conditions weren't complied with, particularly things like CJRS, uh, the furlough scheme. So uh, go and look at the consolidated guidance from the FRC. That's got everything to do with COVID-19 and audit, including issues like working remotely uh, and uh, some of the other risks that we have to assess. But homing in specifically on the issue of fraud, and in particular fraud related to government assistance, the ICAW has produced a know-how guide to this area, which is excellent. Uh, we're going to be talking about fraud as part of our audit updates. At the moment, we're looking specifically at fraud and COVID-19. We have, of course, got an exposure draft of the ISA on fraud 240 uh, out at the moment, which is focusing our mind. There's quite a lot happening internationally to look at what auditors should be doing about fraud. Uh, but this ICAW guide is specifically about COVID-19 and the issues stemming from there. So we'll be covering it in audit updates, uh, but go have a look at the link in Newswire, uh, another well-written article from the Institute. 
So that's our first topic, COVID-19. The second topic is a little bit niche. Uh, It's also to do with the pandemic, uh, but it is an accounting issue. Uh, And it's a niche because it's really aimed at directors and auditors of listed companies. It's the joint regulator's statement from the FRC and the FCA uh, reminding these public companies that they have an additional two months to prepare and file their accounts at the moment under the pandemic and really I think nudging companies and their auditors to make use of that extra time to make sure that the quality of the financial reporting and the robustness of the audit isn't compromised by having to you know rush to meet the, the usual deadline in the middle of a pandemic and difficult financial circumstances for all concerned. So it might not be of immediate uh, relevance. We've got for private companies a current extension on the filing deadlines, uh, which is due to run out in a couple of months time. Um, But this regulator statement is specifically for listed companies. Right, uh, on to our third topic. And the third topic is the FRC's draft plan and budget for 2021-22. That's just been issued by the FRC. Once more, link in Newswire. Uh, Now, the FRC is in the middle of change. It's being morphed into this new regulator, the Audit Reporting and Governance Authority, ARGA. And so the plan and budget talks about that transition process. Uh, The FRC recently reorganised itself into four distinct departments, each one with a a director at the head. Uh, And if you look through, uh, I guess a couple of striking features from this are that in terms of headcount, they are increasing quite significantly. Uh, They've done so in the last few months and they're projected to do so again uh, over the course of the next couple of years. Uh, And that reflects the need to strengthen the regulator and to deal with the uh, criticisms of the regulator from the various audit reviews that we've had uh, and to help them to get ready to transition to ARGA. Uh, They've also got some KPIs, key performance indicators in um, the budget. What does success look like for us? Uh, which I think will be quite useful, quite interesting to read. Um, And finally, there's a link to a topic I think we talked about last time, which is the UK Endorsement Board, uh, which is the new UK body who will be endorsing IFRS for use in the UK and how that relates to the FRC. Uh, So its draft comments um, are due um, by March. uh, So uh, by all means, go and have a look at that. So our last two topics are IASB related um, to do with IFRS. And the first of these is to do with IFRS 16 and the uh, rent concession uh, change that was made due to COVID-19. And you may well recall that we've got a similar uh, concession, um, not quite the same because IFRS 16 is quite different in its accounting treatment on leases to UK GAAP. But the principle is that we want to give um, some relief uh, where companies are getting concessions on rent in an, an order to tide them through the um, the COVID-19 pandemic and ease their cash flow, then those benefits should be taken as they fall. That's certainly how it works in the UK change. Uh, and in both cases, that was payments that were due to be made by June this year. Um, because the pandemic is lengthening, although we are hopefully starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel, uh, that's been extended in the uh, IFRS uh, a concession to June next year, June 22. So we may see a similar change to the FRC's approach in UK GAP as well. We'll have to wait and see for that. Um, but yes, I think that's that's a good proposal from the IASB. And then the last topic, uh, it's a bit of an unusual one. Uh, it's a an exposure draft for a new um, IFRS on rate regulated activities. What on earth you might think are rate regulated activities? Well, there's various industries uh, who have some form of price regulation by um, by the government or by a local regulator. Uh, and that may fix the amount that they can charge their customer uh, for the services. It can also affect the timing of when they're allowed to invoice and to charge their customers for the service. Um, And that can be in a different period um, to the period in which goods and services are actually provided to the customers concerned. So at the moment in IFRS, we would be accounting essentially for the regulated 
uh, in income, um, the regulated rates that we charge. And we tend to account for those in those periods in which they can be charged. Um, that's when we're eligible to earn the, the revenue. Um, but of course, in all other contexts, we'd be thinking about well, when are goods and services provided to the customer. And so the proposal is to realign the accounting so that we create um, regulated assets and regulated liabilities, which help us to reflect the income um, in the period in which we've delivered goods and services. So if we've delivered in advance of being able to charge under the regulatory scheme, then we'd have a uh, an asset and we bring the income in. Um, if we are charging before we've delivered the, the goods and services, then we'd have a corresponding expense and liability. So uh, I think that makes sense. Um, and there was broad support, I think, from the review panel. Uh, it's a, a draft, so there'll be comments on that. Uh, IFRSs tend to then be published and have a um, a 12 to 18 month period at least um, before the start of the first accounting period that they apply to. So this is some way off, um, but it's an interesting concept. I'm not sure to what degree we would need an equivalent bit of UK gap for that, uh, but it'll be one worth watching. And that is it. As at the end of this shortest of all months, uh, we hope that you are surviving um, the pandemic and looking forward to um, schools going back and um, to the gradual um, release of some of the lockdown restrictions that we've been having. Uh, we'll be back in a month's time with further news and updates. And I should say as a last port here, we've been waiting anxiously for the government consultation on the future of audit, the Bayes consultation. Uh, we were expected to be delivering that as part of this month's newswire. Uh, because we expected it would be out in the first half of February. Um, as we record this, we're still waiting it. So it will be covered next month, assuming that they get it out um, before the end of next month. We'll cover that in next month's Newswire. Uh, so stay tuned for that, uh, and we'll see you next month. Look after yourselves, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.